Norman Spack of the class of 1965. Now imagine that there's a problem, and it's been a problem forever, but nobody really understands it correctly. And because no one understands it correctly, no one really knows how to address it correctly. And imagine that you come along and meet the people with this problem and are greatly moved by their suffering. And imagine you figure out what to do and just start doing it and teaching a lot of other people to do it. And as a result, a lot of people are happier and healthier and just plain better off. You've just imagined Norman's career. He's a pediatric endocrinologist, co-founder of the Gender Management Service at Children's Hospital Boston. He introduced the United States and US medicine to what is now the standard protocol for helping transgender children bring the rest of the world and their own bodies into line with it, what they know to be the truth about themselves. Thank you, Norman, for, for coming to share that accomplishment with us. You may think that I was a, um, a biology jock, uh, but I still like to consider myself at least equally a history major, which I was and through three full years here and actually had more credits in history than I had in biology, but don't tell them that. Um, so there'll be a lot of history here. And speaking to the seniors, I want to talk about personal transitions, some before my time, some during my years at Williams in the early 1960s, and some in the 41 years that I've been a pediatrician at Boston Children's Hospital. First principle, all transitions involve risk and stress. And if you don't believe me, think about your own adolescence. <laughs> How we deal with our personal metamorphosis from the larval stage into mature adults may actually reflect the examples of our parents and grandparents during their own transitions, particularly during the cataclysmic 20th century. One immigration story, ours. One among millions. In 1909, my 25-year-old late paternal grandfather was living in his native Russia. He was threatened with, with the Jewish quota of conscription and an expected 25 years service for Jews as cannon fodder in the Tsar's army. Like many, he hastily left for America and headed for Boston, where he had cousins, leaving behind his family with his in-laws, including infant Abraham who later became my dad. The family was separated by World War I, with no contact because of that, and by the Russian Revolution. But in 1921, 12-year-old Abraham, a year prior to his bar mitzvah, and his mother and sister arrived in Boston where he met his father for the first time. He was a gifted student. He attended Tufts, the Hebrew Teachers College, and Harvard Business School, commuting from home by public transportation. And he ultimately became one of the leading Jewish educators of North America in a 60-year career. Now, I grew up in a kind of what we call a shtetl, the Jewish term for a Jewish town, Brookline, Massachusetts, <laughs> uh, where I still live. <laughs> I haven't moved very far. Where most of the neighborhood was Jewish, life took place within a few blocks containing elementary school and its playground, which was across the street from the synagogue and the Hebrew school where my father was the principal. Example two, my first self-determined transition. 
When I applied to college, I was looking to emigrate from my semi-urban town with its huge high school. I sought a small college with space around it without grad students competing for faculty attention. I wanted contact with different people, even if I, it meant that I would be a minority. When I tried to explain to my Yiddish-speaking grandmother that I had been accepted to an unheard of college three hours west of Boston, she could only recall my father's experience of living at home and commuting to and from colleges by trolley, bus, and subway. So her advice to me was, Norman, you'll have to bring a big lunch. <laughs> Example three, William's transitions and metamorphoses. Now for the history. The class of 65 arrived as freshmen immediately to read in the Williams Record newspaper of the college, for those who don't know, that the Board of Trustees has decided that it was in the best interest of the college to eliminate the fraternity system. Now you have to understand that 90% of the upper three classes were enrolled in fraternities and over 50% were housed and fed there. So the trustees' decision threw the campus into an uproar. And some students were enlisting their fraternity alumni to withhold financial support from the college. Now, I had neither personal nor family experience with fraternities, and freshmen were forbidden to enter them. However, in the following fall, after a brief formal sophomore rush, right at this time, a week before fall semester actually, 90% of my class was the last to pledge fraternities in one of the 15 houses. I too joined. It seemed at first to be a good experience socially until we started to have what they called rushing meetings where freshmen next year's prospective pledges were individually reviewed and dissected, often disgracefully. About 15 of us, rising juniors and seniors, decided to leave our fraternity to form a leadership nucleus for the first two residential houses, Berkshire House, now I think renamed Fitch, and the adjoining Prospect House. And the Driscoll Dining Facility was constructed for us. In 1963, I was excited but a bit apprehensive moving into Berkshire House in its inaugural season in September of my junior year. It was like being a freshman all over again. How would our friends still in fraternities regard us? Would we be considered traitors to the cause? We needed to prove that residential houses not based on student selection could actually work and that fraternity traditions were not prerequisites for a, for a fulfilling campus social life. And we had the benefit of being able to try new ventures with the support of the college. We sponsored college-wide film festival and symposia we invited recent alumni, alumni to speak about their experiences in grad school. We had no house alumni, so the college selected honorary alumni for us. <laughs> Men who in their day had not joined a fraternity either by choice or by exclusion. One of the first to visit with us was Morris Ernst. How many of you know who Morris Ernst was? Morris Ernst was class of Williams class of 1909, was the lead attorney who argued and won the landmark case in the US Supreme Court in 1933 that ruled that James Joyce's Ulysses was not obscene and could be published and distributed in this country. 
Morris Ernst, Ernst also was one of the two co-founders of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. And there we were with this amiable icon of civil liberty, civil liberty who spent a full weekend with us at Berkshire House. And he held an open forum in our dining hall's lounge before a packed throng from across the campus. So my transition from fraternity to residential house was shifting from risk to benefit. I ate in my friends' fraternities and they lunched at Berkshire. Parties were always open to everyone. I was elected the second Berkshire House president my senior year and that immediately placed me on the College Council of House Presidents. How would my classmate, Joe Small of Prospect House, and I, who had abandoned our fraternities when they were so vulnerable, be treated by a committee where 15 of the 17 members were fraternity presidents? The tone was set by the council president, David Coolidge who maintained a standard of fairness always in the best interest of the college. The members of the class of 65, unlike many in the previous three classes, were looking forward. I think I heard that a lot recently. <laughs> I wrote this before that. <laughs> Blessed with a talented class agent in Jim Worrell, we have had an annual alumni fund participation rate of 85% in the past decade. The residential house transition laid the groundwork here for other substantive changes. The curriculum originally conceived as 424 and ending as 414 and the multidisciplinary Bromfman Science Center were under faculty debate when we were upperclassmen. But most significantly, exactly one decade after we graduated, the first class of women who had matriculated as freshmen sat where you sit now as seniors ready to graduate come the spring. My remaining transitions came from a desire to do something innovative and take some risk. I was a pediatrician, but I was so involved in tertiary care I was really not suited to be a well baby doctor. I enjoyed the confidential dialogues with adolescents, particularly on matters of sex. So I immediately bailed out of general pediatrics and did a fellowship in adolescent medicine. There I began to treat some transgender young adults and feel badly that no one had gotten to them earlier before they were already formed in a body that they found alien. I retrained in endocrinology in 1992 so I could become board certified with the support of my chief, Joe Mejub, who is here, the chief of pediatric endocrinology at Children's. I was 50 years old at the time I retrained and probably the oldest fellow in the history of Children's Hospital. <laughs> but it was fascinating because my former students had now leaped over me and become my mentors. And that's the way medicine really is transmitted. That same year, 1992, I'm 50, Ruth's not as old as I am. Uh, Ruth, my wife, who had run the English Second Language Composition Program at Tufts, decided to begin a PhD program that led to her being offered a tenure track position leading to a full professorship of English at Bentley University. That year, our son John was in high school. Our daughter Rebecca was in college. What were they thinking <laughs> as they watched Ruth and me, who seemed content in our professional lives, seek to make some changes? Well, maybe it's had an impact on them and in a brief, not, not necessary digression, I want to tell you what they ended up doing. And I want to point those who are here I want them to see, uh, Rebecca couldn't be here because Rebecca, the oldest, is a, a social worker by training and the guidance counselor for the upper half students in the K to eight school in Brookline, Massachusetts, <laughs> <laughs> uh, where she, from where she graduated high school. 
her husband, Arthur, took advantage of the um, co-op programs that, knew, that um, Northeastern Law School had to offer. He was noticed to have particular talent in the, in the courtroom, and he was fairly soon thereafter hired as an assistant district attorney for Norfolk County, moving up to the Superior Court as the only male on a five-person sex crime domestic violence unit. He now has running his own law firm dealing exclusively in family law. Our son, um, John, are you, are you here? <laughs> I want them to see you because I think people may have questions for you. Uh, uh, and his wife, Hagar. <laughs> um, both of them, immediately after c college, went into nonprofit education work. John, initially in after school programming with uh, citizen schools, then uh, Hagar. Uh, in, in a couple of incarnations, but it was working for Jumpstart. And it can work, folks. They both got masters, interesting masters. John got a masters, a new masters given by Penn in nonprofit NGO leadership. One year, two semesters, no thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Hagar, um, John is now the COO of a significant non uh, nonprofit that does mentorship programs, started in San Francisco, and he's taking it national. Hagar, who um, was, were, was working for Summer Search, has, has been made the chief executive of the Bay Area Summer Search program. S Summer Search takes kids who are at risk at high school mentors them, supports them all the way through. And in the Bay Area, they not only have, what is it, 91% college graduation rate. College graduation rate. And it's in seven cities around the country. She got an, an interesting master's in education at Stanford in educational policy. Two semesters, <laughs> one year, no thesis. <laughs> So, there they are, they're going to be around for, for a bit, but, um, you know, a lot of, in a, in a down economy, sometimes nonprofit work not only is available because it's privately supported, but provides incredible training because one gets to do so many things around people who are excited about making a, di a difference in the lives of others. So, personal transitions are like wooden Rus Russian dolls. Open the outermost and there's another within. It's equally shiny, often different, and hopefully pleasing to the eye. My transgender patients are transitioning into their affirmed gender, and my former trainees are now opening new dolls as they inaugurate new programs for transgender youth. In now, in the last three years, eight cities in the U.S. have opened programs modeled after ours. Yes, including New York City and San Francisco. And finally, this Bicentennial Award ex experience has given me a chance to reflect on events that occurred at a pivotal time in my life and in the life of this college. Indeed, I experienced transitions here that shaped my future year by year. And in the process, I was being transformed, yard by yard. <laughs>